Okay, thank you, Tom, and also a warm welcome from my side. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Julia Wagemann, and yeah, so thank you again for the invitation uh, to speak today um, uh, to this workshop, and but also to be part uh, to the workshop the next two days. I really look forward to diving more into the technical details because I'm actually also more like a geek. And, but um, I used my presentation today more giving more like a setting and high level scene for and also giving a bit more of food for thought for the next two days in order to because we already together so we can also think of okay where do we actually want to go not only the next two or three years but also which goes beyond any project frameworks and also the next 10 years so how do we want to how do we want to see open earth observation in 10 years time so just a short uh, introduction for myself so what tom already said so for the past 10 years i've been working in the intersection between data providers and data users uh, and a lot of activities aimed to increase the use and also uptake of open earth observation data so um, first, the first four to five years, I worked for um, European Earth data providers such as ESA and ECMWF. And for the past five years, I work in, in my role in an independent consultant. Um, I have worked with uh, data providers, but also private companies, um, stakeholders, policy organizations to, uh, to minimize the gap between data providers and users. So my activities are often or mainly related, so I engage a lot with users um, with trainings, but also user consultations and running uh, surveys among um, users of, of Earth observation data. So I would like to take you today on a time travel of around 25 years of open Earth data. So you probably would think now, oh, okay, hang on, we don't even have 25 years of open data, but this time travel includes also the next 10 years. And so I'd like to jump back to the past when open earth data actually started because we even can't imagine it, but there was a time where we actually didn't have open data and we needed to order and pay for satellite images. Then um, the, the major part will be, okay, where are we today with what do we struggle? What challenges do we all face? And then how can we take all the challenges at the moment to the next 10 years um, of time? Okay, when did it all begin? Probably this is no news, but uh, does anyone know the, tie, the, the year where we had a big change of open Earth observation data? 2008, exactly, yes. Okay, so 2008, sorry? Okay, so, so probably this is when the discussion started. Okay, okay, good. So then 2006, and I will update the slides, but um, so in the end, there's like in, in the community, there's, there's a lot of papers out there. Um, around 2006, 2008, um, there were the ideas and also the first agreements to disseminate Earth observation data on a with an open data policy. So, and uh, um, the start made uh, USGS, Barbara Ryan was a key player in that. She signed actually the agreement. And since uh, 2008, the Landsat data were then freely available, free of charge. We see here um, on top, like on the top graph here, like since 2008, the download of Landsat level one scenes, it just exploded. So um, now it just crossed more than 170 million downloads of level one scenes. So this is also, we have to keep in mind, this is only from the statistics from the USGS Aero Center, uh, but then we also have a lot of copies of Landsat deities data in other services. And uh, here below we see, we see we see the number of citations that increased after the the cost of the Lancer data um, yeah got um, or decreased and so um, yeah this is also basically a driver of open science of scientific discovery um, etc. 
Good. Another game changer, and probably this wouldn't have happened without 2008 and USGS opening up the Landsat archive. Um, we have also then since 2014, when the Copernicus program started and also decided to disseminate all the data that will be acquired and also has been acquired um, before um, be disseminated under free, full and open uh, data license. Good. So, but where are we now? So basically we have open Earth observation data everywhere. So open data is not a, a big thing. This is more like a, a standard now. But this also led to a lot of implications which we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis now uh, today. So the first one is we have an increase in exploitation in the data volume. So there's also a lot of figures out there and I don't think there's an actually actual estimate of how much data is actually available. But we have several hundreds of petabytes available from different data providers um, and also, just as I, um, I found from 2022 from the European Commission, a, uh, a, a, date, a statistics that uh, they estimate around 16 terabytes are just additionally disseminated daily through the Copernicus program, but this might already be um, even more now. So this exploitation of data um, brought us, um, yeah, like an increase in volume, velocity, but also variety of data. And... Um, this had three key trends um, that result uh, from, from this exploitation of data. So the first one is diversification of users. So before we had open data, it, the remote sensing and Earth observation was mostly an expert field. So people with expert knowledge and remote sensing background use the data and mainly also for data science. But now because it's freely available, the potential of the uh, um, potential application areas is just um, yeah, un unthinkable. And so there's also much more uh, diverse users uh, from different application domains that are interested in using the data. And because we are because of the sheer volume of uh, data, we also have an emergence of cloud based um, services and um, new new ideas how to actually bring the data better to users and this together uh, brings us also to a growing demand for training and capacity building. And so this uh, diversity, um, diversification of users, this was actually also the motivation for my um, PhD, because when I worked at ECMWF, I was involved in a program. It was between 2015 and 2018. I worked in a project that um, looked or evaluated how OGC web services, if this could be a way to provide ERA reanalysis data um, um, without download um, to data, uh, to, to users. And uh, when I asked 10 people, okay, who are actually our users? So because one part was also to, to, inter, uh, to work together with users and better understanding them, um, then I got 10 different responses. And so um, after I left ECMWF, I said, okay, this could be actually an idea um, to better understand who are actually users of Big Earth data. And this is then how I started. And um, I worked on my, on my PhD thesis um, and I submitted it last year. And so basically I um, ran a web-based survey on um, uh, users of Big Earth data. So first, I was interested in how users working with the data at the moment, which challenges they face, um, yeah, which programming language, but also in the future, um, how they would like to work with data. Are they ready to use cloud-based services? And if not, um, what are potential training needs that, um, that need to be addressed? So there, um, uh, you, you can have a look to these papers, but I will also highlight the main outcomes um, of, uh, or some of the outcomes of these papers now. So you actually can also save time reading them. Okay, so basically um, in the first paper, I uh, specifically was interested in, okay, are users able to find, access, interoperate, and reuse data? So FAIR is, um, all, is, 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 a, is a word we all know. Um, 
And there was one question specifically, um, which um, specifically highlighted um, whether open earth data is fair. So I asked users, um, what are the biggest obstacles related to big earth data? And I gave them 12 different um, options. Um, including limited processing capacity, growing data volume, data are disseminated in a non-standardized way, data discovery, um, lacking easy to use tools, etc. And so here the five or the top five challenges that are related to finding, accessing and interoperating data um, are, are related to, to FAIR. So users have challenges to find, access and also interoperate uh, data. So this um, brings us to the um, to, 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 to this iceberg of petabytes of data. But if we then actually um, think of, okay, we have now petabytes of big earth data available, but can they actually also be used? Then um, we see here that we have only like the tip of the iceberg that basically is or can be probably used by users and is reused all um, again. But then there's like a big bulk of data that is constantly archived, but is actually, actually inaccessible and unused. But what about reproducibility? So reproducibility is quite a big uh, aim and also quite a big word. Um, but we, we could actually think of in the era of Jupyter Notebooks, it has also never been easier to be reproducible and also to share your results in a reproducible way. Um, so just as some statistics on Jupyter Notebooks that like there are more than 10 million notebooks now available on GitHub and this is just uh, it's increasing on a daily basis. And it basically became within the, 10, the last 10 years the de facto, de facto standard for data exploration analysis and uh, training. Uh, but, um, and this is not actually um, results from me, but um, during the research um, on my third paper, I came across a paper that I found um, very enlightening and interesting. And based on this paper, I'd like to ask you now to go to Slido and enter the hashtag OEMC. And then I will activate one question. So because there was one paper from Pimentel 2019, and they investigated or they elaborated or analyzed uh, more than 1 million notebooks on GitHub and had a look if the notebooks can be executed and if they can be executed, if also the same results are produced. And so my first question is, how many of the notebooks could be executed? And uh, to the technician, we could now go to Slido to see the results. Okay, so oh, we see, oh, so it's a very pessimistic audience, like, <laughs> so this is just execution, um, so, okay, so um, we have now oh, more than 70%, um, less than 25%, we have some optimists with 50%, um, okay, Okay, good. And so then my next question is, um, I stop this now. And the next question is, how many of the notebooks actually produce the same result? So the notebooks that are truly reproducible. Okay. Ah, yeah, but we still have some optimists. This is good. <laughs> okay, but less than, less than, less than before. Okay, but actually quite mixed. Okay, now we can go back to the slides, please. Okay, um, so basically the actual results now, um, I just jump over here, is basically on the first question, so how many notebooks can be executed? Um, there was like one out of four, so 25% um, of the notebooks available on GitHub could be executed. And then um, only 4% uh, produced actually the same results. So reproducibility is still an issue, even though we have a lot of tools available. 
Another uh, challenge and current reality we all face is the fragmented data landscape. And uh, I just also added here a disclaimer, so I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, it, so if you don't see the service you're working on, this is not, um, not per, uh, I, I didn't intend to, but there is a lot of things going on, we all know. So there is uh, different cloud services, a lot of platforms, um, yeah, a lot of tools that help us to work with these platforms, then cloud native geospatial is a new um, term, analysis ready data, um, data cubes, um, etc. But um, I work a lot with users in training events, and this is really a challenge. So I would say we all are experts in this room, right? So we actually know the landscape. And I must admit my personal opinion or my personal reaction here is I, it's really hard for me to keep up with what, what is actually developed and um, what, is, what is new. And so the, the challenge is even bigger for people who are not into 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 the or who are not as expert as as we are and so uh, i work with a lot of users and uh, um, uh, people work, uh, participating in trainings who are interested in working with copernicus data and one example we developed one training course um, this year and we needed to ask users to register for different seven different data access services in order to um to to get the data we needed for the data for, for, for the training we wanted to offer and so it's like a yeah a, a big challenge uh, that um yeah we we have to, we face at a moment um in the in our community so i also ask about data access preferences um and modalities um in my survey um for my phd and so um, one question was, how do you currently access big earth data? And so one, uh, one result was that downloading is still often the prevailing mode of data access, but followed by cloud-based services. And the survey was run in 2019 and 20. So I also would imagine this is now already a bit, uh, a bit better, um, the statistics. But when, um, ask, when I ask how interested um, they are to migrate to a cloud service in the future, then there was an overall interest to migrate uh, to and use cloud-based services. So more than 70% of the users who participated in the survey showed an interest. But we also saw that um, there is actually a difference, a geographical difference between Europe and USA and Canada. So if what we see here is that um, the dark green ones is um, um, if, the, if this specific data access service is currently used, and then the light green one is if it is wished to be or there's an interest to use it in the future. And so the current uptake of cloud service seems to be already higher in the US, in USA and Canada. Um, and at the moment in Europe, the uptake is still lower, but um, there is, was more than half who were interested in using cloud-based services in the future. And then one of the last questions of the survey was, okay, like if you're using cloud, because this is really a new way of um, accessing data and using it and processing it, would you be able also to specify or estimate your technical requirements? Because you often ask when you, and when you start with a cloud-based service, how much storage do you need or how much RAM or how much uh, uh, processing power do you need? And so only one out of four were able to actually specify also their needs for their data application, uh, data applications. And so this basically brought uh, me to the conclusion that there is also a, a bigger need for training and capacity building. Okay, so this was now more my view. I think you all also have um, additional views on the current uh, state of um, open earth observation. Um, but where are we heading now? So. Um, I would like to take you now to from 2023 to um, 10 years uh, um, ahead of time to 2033. How will our open Earth observation community look like? 
So this is my take here, um, but I will also ask you in a minute, what is actually your take? So I expect, okay, there is giving um, the, uh, the estimate, uh, there will be more and more data, there will be even more users also from different, uh, different application domains. Um, there's a move also like open data is not actually an issue, but it's more moving now to also um, advocate for open science. There will be also a, a talk just after me. Um, there's cloud native geospatial um, AI and machine learning applications. I'd also say generative AI will have an impact. Um, and But I'm interested actually now on what are the most pressing challenges you think we need to solve in the next 10 years. And so I just have to, okay. And now we can go back uh, to the Slido, please. Okay, I see data spaces, data volume, standardization, Okay, data volume and probably related also data access, training. Interoperability, fragmentation, okay. But data volume seems quite, quite pressing. Oh, standardization. Okay, good. Um, so then I, I ask also to go back to the slides again. So thank you for giving your perspective on this. Um, I think a lot of these challenges we face like data standardization, cloud-based services, data access, um, interoperability between data services, they are not only technical challenges. I would even believe and go um, in, in this way that we will find technical challenges, but there is also a set of um, uh, as, um, adaptive challenges. And so um, I just read a book about leading in complexity and they differentiate between technical challenges, which are usually known answers. There, is, there will be solutions, even though we don't know it yet. Um, and it, it can be implemented fairly, fairly fast. But then there's uh, adaptive challenges. They're usually unknown. Um, they are difficult to identify. Um, it requires a lot of changes. And often there is a lot of stakeholders and, and parties involved to actually um, come, to, come to a solution. And uh, just, and I think one, a lot of these challenges we face are in this realm of um, technical versus adaptive challenges. So just one example on cloud services, this is my opinion, and I also like to get challenged on this, but I believe like the technical things we will figure out fairly soon. We see that like with Stack, for example, the community was quite, quite rapidly implemented and adopted, um, and this will work actually. But the more challenging part will be the adaptive challenge to actually bring cloud service providers and data providers together to um, agree on inter interoperating data services. And this often also goes beyond current metrics of success and, um, and needs to focus on resource efficiency and also sustainability. Because the way we operate at the moment that a lot of data archives are um, are copied in different data services is also not uh, sustainable in the future with uh, growing data volumes. So um, yeah, and so basically, I also would like just to uh, to motivate you for um, the next two days. Um, also think of like because these adaptive challenges they always also require us to actually think a bit outside the box and think differently. Um, to and this doesn't mean that what how we got here, that it also brings us to the next 10 years. There is, I always take this, um, um, this, this uh, example on, I feel that we are at a moment, our, 
getting out of our comfort zone. The question is also just, okay, are we in the fear zone or already in the learning zone? So this is actually also up to us um, how, how we want to embrace all the challenges that uh, lie uh, ahead of us. And I would like to conclude with uh, two questions, which we can all take home. Um, and also for the next two days, we can try to uh, discuss about. The first question is, how do you envision open earth observation in the next 10 years and also what uh, is required to, to get there. And yeah, with this, um, I look forward to discussing a lot with you and thank you for your attention. Thank you, so, Julia, so much. And uh, we want the slide results, please. <laughs> so please share. Uh, we have time for questions. Please don't run away, uh, questions. Yes, uh, Stefan, Stefan was first. So Stefan, uh, on the side, please. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I was struck by one of the comments you made on this ad adaptive kind of capacity. Um, in particular, that we could and we have to become more resource efficient. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is really going on? We're not really sufficiently discussing that. So everybody says, you know, Landsat, I'm, I'm a bit playing here the devil's advocate, but everybody says Landsat archive open, great. Yes, but what too much more energy use has that just led to? Has anybody calculated that part? So this sustainability and resource efficiency part, we are not, I think, yet discussing and tackling also not in this place, but I think it's time to do that. And you already pointed to some potential solution on the storage side. So what is currently happening in this space in trying to make storage more efficient? And are there going to be projects in the future tackling, tackling this issue? Thanks. So thank you for your comment. Uh, like, I absolutely agree. Um, regarding, I. I didn't see a lot yet on specifically discussing uh, this question, um, but it's it's more like from what I reflected on when I pr uh, prepared this talk was like, well, we at the moment, the reality is we have several copies of Landsat and Copernicus in different data services. I also often get a question from training participants, well, okay, with which service do I use now? Um, and given the amount that like, in, I, I read an article um, some, some weeks ago that like we expect, I think several hundreds of additional satellite data be launched in the next 10 years. So given the fact that we have this additional increase in volume, this is, this is not, not sustainable in the future, but uh, there is, I agree there's, I haven't seen a lot of discussions on this, how, how to actually face this and how to, to reduce also the copies of several, this, the same data set. 